Um, okay, so just for the sake of the uh, recording, we've just begun. We're uh, studying the win of the month, month section, and our recording uh, for some reason didn't start automatically this week. Um, yeah, would anybody like to tell about something that you've, uh, yeah, a win that you've had to kick us off? Uh, hi, this is uh, Koichi from PNNL. Hey, Koichi. Hi, uh, I just put on the chat that we got the paper accepted and then published in a final form. Uh, actually, it took some time, but this paper used and ask resources to you know develop an algorithm to track very strong uh, thunderstorms that really produce a lot of uh, precipitation, damaging a lot of infra infrastructure. And also we use Cori to run the computer models, climate models to a bunch of simulations. And then also we used uh, NARSC resources to develop and they use the machine learning uh, algorithm that uh, automatically detect the atmospheric environment that favorable for producing such a strong uh, storms. So we really heavily relied on NASC uh, resources and we did acknowledge, of course, the NASC in the acknowledgement section. So I just put the uh, the link to that, that paper. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, and thank you for that. And that, actually that's a that's a good cool point. When, when you um, uh, submit papers that we're using um, nurse resources, it's really helpful to, you, to us if you in, include an acknowledgement. And we have um, somewhere on our webpage at the uh, www.nurse.gov, there, uh, there's a kind of a format that you can use. But we use this to kind of, you know, this, this helps in our argument for um, you know, funding from the DOE, basically. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I think we well, copied, yeah. Yeah, copied that uh, acknowledgement statement from the website, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so thanks for doing that. That's uh, really helpful. So the um, machine learning for uh, atmospheric work is mm -hmm. is kind of an interesting field. So, were you using the machine learning to to sort of speed up the solver or to look at the results of the the, you know, oh, the traditional for, method and identify things? For this slide, more tra tra uh, for this slide, more traditional. Actually, uh, we use the uh, self organizing map uh, type of machine learning to to really you know. Uh, yep. find uh, find out uh, you know particular uh, high dimension structure of atmosphere using the, you know just compress all the different variables at different height levels so that it's just difficult for us to do and it's very nonlinear processes so uh, machine learning it's really nice to tease out those um, patterns that are really hidden in the atmosphere and then DOE is really pushing to use machine learning in our field as well. So um, this is more typical traditional way, but uh, you know, a bunch of us are also working on to use machine learning to develop a uh, predictive part of the model, particularly for those processes that the uh, our global model cannot resolve like turbulence and convections. And uh, yeah, probably, is somewhere down in the future, I'd like to post another work that uh, some of us are working on developing such a cloud, uh, machine, to use machine learning to, to study about the cloud and aerosol interactions and then use those machine learning um, method or trained algorithm as a part of the global models. But uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. But this is more yeah. traditional one, but it's still very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, and I understand that um, thunderstorms in uh, atmospheric models are, are quite difficult to detect normally because they're, yeah, they, they, they tend to need quite high resolution. Yeah, and it's very difficult and um, could be very subjective uh, traditionally. Uh, even we do not really strictly agree with what constitute, uh, in our case, this particular strong storms, what we call mesoscale convective systems. But uh, mm. the first part of the, this paper is really try to make it as objective as possible and as realistic as, as possible. Mm. So it's just three stages, you know, that algorithm and the model simulations using a new uh, global model mm. using sort of variable resolution uh, grid and then apply, finally apply machine learning algorithm to both observation and models to 
will objectively compare the reality and, and the model. Right. Yeah, that sounds, sounds really good. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, great work. Um, anybody else got a, a win or a success that they'd like to share? So we can uh, go to the, the flip side of the coin here, which is which is today I learned. And yeah, what we what we do here is research. And part of the, the nature of research is that you get stuck on things, you hit dead ends, you try you try new things and they don't work, climbing over your quite challenging learning curves. And this is actually, you know, it can be a little painful and frustrating, but it's not. A bad thing because you know this is this is kind of how we how we learn stuff and and you know, how we uh, you know, get new knowledge and, and new discoveries out into the uh, community. So um, yeah, so this section is kind of an opportunity to talk about you know something that bit you, something that tripped you up, or even just something interesting that you stumbled across. Uh, you know, a, a paper or a webinar or, or something like that that had uh, you know, some new tips, something that might benefit um, other nurse users. Oh, so Laurie just posted a, a comment in the chat about a, a recently learned. Yes, this is something that is in our documentation, but doesn't get a whole lot of noise. Um, do you want to describe what you found, Laurie? Sure. Uh, it turns out that things on home and CFS are automatically backed up for one week. And there's this hidden directory called dot snapshots. And uh, that saved me <laughs> recently. So I was glad to find that out. And I uh, wanted to let other people know that it exists. Hmm. And it's that directory is very difficult to find is the wrong word, but it's not obvious because if you ls-la in your home directory, uh, it's not visible there. You, you kind of need to, it's almost like you need to know about the, the secret code. You have to ls-a dot snapshots and the system will show you what's inside that directory. And if I remember rightly, uh, I think Laurie looked at this more recently than, than me and can probably correct me, the snapshot gets taken once a day. So if you break something today, so long as it was on the system yesterday, you should be able to get it back. Right, I think there were seven uh, in there, so that's nice. Yeah, and I suspect that it gets taken sometime during the, during the night, although I, I don't remember offhand. But yeah, that's uh, that's quite a helpful tip. I've uh, been saved by that one a couple of times too. So for me, most of my kind of hard lessons over the last well, more than a week, month, um, have been around tips and tricks using uh, something called SPAC, which you may have heard of, which we actually have on our system. You can you can module load SPAC. The default one at the moment is a, a fairly old version. It's 0.14.2. I think it's, it's over a year old. Um, Spec's been rapidly, actively developed, and so things change pretty quickly. Um, we The latest version that we have is 0.16.1. So if you do a, a module AV or module avail spec, you'll see that. Um, and uh, it's quite neat. You you can describe using a, a DSL what you would like. So you can say, yeah, uh, I would like to install uh, your package slate at version um, on this stack with this compiler. Uh, and the setup that we've got will um, install it by default into a directory in your home directory called uh, SW for, for software. Um, in the module file for 0.16.1, you can actually change that. There's a, a variable called something like spec preferred base. Uh, if you do a, a module show on the module file, you'll see it. 
But, so this is a, a quite powerful tool that when everything goes smoothly, it, it turns the, the nightmare of resolving all your dependencies and getting all the, the necessary things installed to get a, a particular piece of software running uh, to you know just a, a single command line, really a, a couple to check what it's going to do and then uh, and then tell it to go ahead and do it, which which is really nice. But uh, of course, software is complex and and things don't always work. And so, yeah, there are, uh, when it breaks, it can be a little challenging to find why. So I've been uh, learning quite a lot, um, partly via the um, SPAC web pages, but also particularly via uh, SPAC's um, Slack channel, which is a yeah, quite the, the, the group of developers and uh, yeah, community around that is actually quite helpful at answering things. So I'll, Share a link on this too. Uh, here we go, spec.io. There's a whole lot of information there. Um, we have uh, some stuff actually about it on our web pages as well. Under um, yeah, docs.mask. But uh, yeah. Give it a whirl. Um, you might find that uh, it works really well. Yeah, you might find that things are complicated, but you know you can also uh, drop us a line, send us a, a ticket to um, ask for assistance with it. Uh, I see a couple of other things have uh, wrapped up in the chat. Oh, uh, am I pronouncing that correctly? The maximum time you could run on a single GPU node is four hours. Um, this is on Cori GPU. Do, uh, do you want to tell us about what you learned? Oh, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was just trying to run some hyperparameter search on my neural network. And uh, I, yep. I was trying to call, I, I, I first tried to use on Jupyter Hub. I find that my job gets very kind of constantly killed after a certain period of time. I didn't really count how long that is. And then I switched to the configurable GPU. Uh, so after I call one of that GPU, I think I can get like a stable running period of time, but that GPU only lasts for like four hours. Uh, so I was just wondering if there's a way to call the GPU for a longer time, because uh, you know, the hyperparameter search, you already kind of scale with the amount of the number of attempts you make. So the longer you search, the better model you will get for your neural network. So yeah, yep. uh, some people in the chat has already given me some help. So I think that's uh, that's very helpful. I, I will try to check it out. Yeah, so there's some good good tips there actually about um, being able to uh, tweak the or find the constraints and yeah, running uh, running overnight. So that's uh, that's good to know. So we are getting up to 25 past 11. Um, we've probably got a, a few more minutes. If uh, Does anybody else have a tip or trick or, or something that they would like to learn because it's uh, a sticking point? And if not, we'll move on to the next session. Um, it's on, uh, on Slack. All right, so for our next section, uh, we have a, a space for announcements and calls for, for participation. So there's, there's kind of a lot going on at the moment. Um, if you scanned through the weekly email this week, you'll have seen uh, and uh, emails that went out. Big thing coming up is Perlmutter's dedication will be happening next Thursday, almost at this time, actually slightly earlier at 10.30 uh, a.m. Um, we have a, a link here in the slides for the calendar. You should be able to see it in the weekly email and probably in email. So that's kind of a, a fairly exciting event that uh, everybody at desk is paying a lot of attention to and 
yeah, uh, come along and, and join the celebration. We have a Nurse Plus NVIDIA GPU hackathon coming up. The original deadline for submissions, I think, was yesterday, but it's been extended. So you have until the end of the week. So if you have a code that you're working on to get GPU ready and you would like some assistance from experts from both NERSC and NVIDIA, um, that's still available. The uh, web address here is in the slides. Um, there's a few training events coming up. Um, there's some intro, intro to nurse coming up on June 3, so it's in a couple of weeks. Uh, some of you might have seen uh, Apentra's Parallelware, which was a topic of the day a couple of months ago now. Um, so Apentra's holding office hours for uh, assistance getting up and going with Parallelware on June 9. Uh, and I think there's a link in the weekly email to where you can, uh, uh, what do you call it, make an appointment for those. Uh, another training event that NERSC is coming up is a crash course in supercomputing. And another one that I'll, I'll give you like a, a heads up on that hasn't actually been announced yet, but it will be very soon, is uh, we'll be doing some training for using LMOD. So uh, some of you may already be familiar with LMOD. It gets used at uh, a number of other sites um, at, on Cori. We are using uh, the modules environment that we use is TCL modules. It's kind of the original one. LMOD is a, it's a little more than a re-implementation of it, but it's a um, kind of a, a follow on from it. Uh, the same sorts of ideas with uh, you know, a newer scripting language behind it and you know, a, few, a few sort of updates. Uh, so this is an announcement that was a little bit earlier that we have a compile queue. If you're doing um, your long running compiles or DevOps sort of work, the compile queue is uh, you know, meant to meet those needs a little bit more neatly than using a login node. Um, I think that previously you needed to request access to it. It's now uh, available to all. So I can see there's a bit of chat going on in the in the Zoom chat. Let's uh, run through that so that everybody has seen it. Um, uh, so there's some discussion around um, uh, uh, around the some some of the uh, training that uh, was uh, Ivo was oh, uh, was talking about um, doing. Uh, checkpoint restart as a way of stopping and starting things. I, I, we just recently had a checkpoint restart um, training session on MPI agnostic, uh, network agnostic checkpoint restart. And I think we have some notes on that in, in the documentation pages. It's probably under running jobs here, checkpoint restart. So, uh, yeah, particularly for for uh, your serial and some MPI jobs, if it doesn't have its own built-in checkpointing, DMTCP can be quite handy. Um, you know, it's, it's also helpful to know that LMOD supports TCL format module files. Yes, um, and in uh, on Perlmutter, we intend to be using uh, LMOD. So yeah, there will be a, a little bit of transition. It should be fairly smooth in that most things work in exactly the same way. There's a, there's a couple of slight differences, um, but just very usefully, if you have, particularly if you have your own module files, LMOD understands TCL module files as well. Uh, which is compile queue only for Haswell, not for KNL. I believe it is only for Haswell. Um, it is a good point though. So compiling on KNL can be pretty slow because uh, I guess KNL gets its performance out of uh, having lots of cores, not out of uh, any one core being particularly fast. So for that, for compiling on KNL, you probably still at the moment at least need to use a, a regular job. I think that's a good question though. Um, that's, that's a good point to, um you know, bring up that uh, since some codes for KNL do need to be compiled on a KNL node, um, 
I, I think we could discuss internally if we want to add a KNL node to the um, compile QoS. Hmm, that's a that's a good point actually. And uh, could you comment about the uh, the debug queue time limit because the KNL com compilation, especially for a large code, can take a while. So yes, it is possible to cross compile the KNL from a login node. Something that uh, I've discovered and probably several others of us here have is that the part that cross compiling most often trips up on is if you're using uh, CMake or dot slash configure and they're trying to run little, um, ex you know, they build and run executables to see, you know, if, if things are available or if things work. And um, unless the package has been very well developed, quite often it will try to, you know, build and run some executable to test something. And of course, because you're cross compiling the KNL, um, the, it doesn't work on the login node because it's, it's built using um, AVX instruction sets. So for that, sometimes just going to a KNL node through, you know, getting an interactive node just for the dot slash configure step can help to sort of get through that part. And then you can go back to the login node to do the actual compiling, uh, which can be a lot faster than doing the full compile on the KNL node. Um, yes, I think Cori GPU is probably different enough that it's, uh, uh, it's a bit of a challenge to cross compile. Um, the the Cori GPU nodes have uh, NVIDIA uh, V100 GPUs on them. So Perlmutter will have uh, a 100 GPUs, so the next, the next sort of model along. So, I have uh, lost my window, here we go. So that's the announcements that uh, I know about. Does anybody else have um, any announcements or CFPs that would be good for no excuses to know about. If not, we'll go on to our next section, which is our topic of the day. And today we're going to talk about running on GPUs at NERSC and particularly take a look at some example job scripts for Cori GPU. So Kind of before we get started, I'll uh, put some links here of uh, things that are useful for when you're running on Cori GPU. Actually, the first one that I haven't put on there is that if you're not on Cori GPU yet, but you're working to prepare a prepare some code to be GPU ready um, in preparation for Perlmutter, you can request access to the Cori GPU nodes uh, via help.nurse.gov. Under thinking, thinking. It wants me to log in. That seems like more work than is necessary. Oh, that's because it's uh, going through service now. Um, but there's a there's a link on that page for requests, and one of the requests is access to Cori GPU nodes. Um, so other, other helpful things we have, oops, some uh, Nurse 101 and other appointments uh, available. This has sort of been there for a little while. We now have a GPU basics and GPUs in, in Python appointment types. Oops. Clicking on these uh, for the slides doesn't help. <laughs> oh. Jumps too far forwards, all right. Um, we can post a, a link later in the chat, or if you have the slides open in front of you, you should be able to click on the link there. So uh, that, um, so we have a, a few people uh, with us that are part of the NESAP program who have some uh, Cori GPU uh, scripts to 
share and uh, and give us a little bit of a walkthrough. Um, so I think we have uh, Ro and Kevin and possibly Daniel and Daddy and Laurie on. Um, would any of you like to share a screen and uh, show off a script and walk us through what you're doing? I can go after someone has a very, very, very basic script as there's one trick to mine that I don't want to confuse people with. I can go first. Yep. All right. That sounds good. I'll stop sharing and uh, hopefully you should be able to just click share and it allows you. Yep, this is looking good. Can you see? Yes, that's working. Okay, so this is a quick example. It's gonna demonstrate actually how to run a Jupyter notebook. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show you that. This is my job script for Cori GPU. Um, so I'm doing an SBAT CGPU. I'm asking for four GPUs here. I'm emailing myself to let me know how the job is going. And uh, for anybody who uses Python and wants to source a custom Karma environment, this is how you do it um, inside your script. So I load the Python module and then I source this environment called Papermill I've already built. Um, Papermill is this uh, library that allows you to run Jupyter Notebooks from the command line and also to insert overriding parameter cells. So Papermill is really cool. We have some docs about that. Um, and here's, here's where I'm launching it. So I have an S run where I ask for my GPUs and then I have this script called run paper mill. So that's okay. here. Um, I'm not going to explain everything, option. but I import the library called paper okay. mill. I do some arg parsing and stuff, but the powerful part is here. This is where I'm actually launching my Jupyter notebook. Um, from a, a batch script. So I don't actually have to log into Jupyter and I don't have to do anything interactively, which is cool. Um, so I'm launching this notebook called Save Desk Flexible. And then it's saving the output um, on CFS or, or pretty much wherever you want. And then the thing that my notebook is actually doing then is spinning up a DAS cluster. And I <laughs> can't explain everything here, but DAS is kind of a Python parallel task-based library. So I check that I have a GPU, I spin up a desk cluster, and then I'm doing some QDF processing. So that's kind of pandas, but on a GPU. And then uh, when I'm done, I write some output files and shut my cluster down. So in this one job script, I'm able to start and run a bunch of Jupyter notebooks. So I think it's pretty powerful. Um, if you have questions about this, you can submit tickets about um, desk or paper mill or uh, rapids and they'll come to me. I'm happy to help you. So that is really neat. Um, yeah, I think I'll echo uh, William's question. Yeah, about William. So I see your question about sharing yeah. the script at the moment. This is not quite ready to share, but we're going to publish. I'm going to put up a public version of this stuff in the next week or two because it's going to be part of a paper as SciPy. Um, but there's paths in here that we don't want users to see. But yes, um, we'll we'll post yeah. it like in the next two weeks. Sounds really good. So the um, the workflow for developing that would then be, I guess, that you um, begin by requesting a uh, interactive GPU node through Jupyter.nurse.gov. Do your kind of development with Papermill there to you know for the for the GPU side of it and then go on to develop the, the shell script separately? Yeah, actually it's kind of backwards. So I, I would start by logging into Jupyter and you know developing some script interactively so it, it does what I need. Um, and then when I have what I want, I can wrap it in paper mill and then paper mill will override certain cells for me so I can do a parameter scan. And then I can put that in my batch script. Um, but yeah, other, there are other solutions too. Um, so yeah, there's Jupe text, and I, th I think there's other options, but I like paper mill, it's easy to use. So that's the one I've done. Nice, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that's a, a very neat example, thank you. Um, Kevin, do you want to uh, go on to your script? Uh, sure, okay, let me make sure I've got it open here. I got pulled into three separate Slack meetings in that two second window. Ugh, busy, busy, busy. 
Yeah, there's oh. a lot going on right now, isn't there? Yeah. Okay. So um, this is AMRX's essentially sample run script. And I can throw this one in the chat for you guys to use as a reference. Um, it is our reference. Um, it is a bit outdated in some places, but it's outdated in a way that we actually depend on. Uh, so if you look at the example scripts in the docs, um, here's what you normally get. And you see that most use this GPU per task to define that for this given rank, you're gonna have so many GPUs. So the only difference that we do uh, uh, compared to this is we, we loosen this. Amorex inside of it uh, looks at all visible GPUs and parses them out inside the code at initialization. So it doesn't do this upfront and limit what it can see, allowing if right now it's really for testing and we don't really use it. We most of the time have one task per GPU like most people, but um, yep. we don't want to limit that right now because we have various testing and you know uh, experimental things that we're doing so that's really the only difference from it uh, overall but we have this code that actually uh, this script actually has all the kind of things that you would need to do to run on core gpu so uh, gpu time limit job id uh, we use m1759 change it to yours and then all the tricky pits we've actually got a note down here about what they are so a uh, number of nodes, number of tasks, CPUs per task. And then instead of GPU per task, we use GRESS equals GPU to get GPUs per node. And we always assign all eight as visible, available, and able to play around with once you get inside the code. So that, that's a difference that we want to do. What you probably want to do is change this to GPUs per task is equal to one for most of your codes. But otherwise, this works nicely. And then we have a couple examples here for, for one node of Cori GPU, you would set it up like this. For two, you'd set it up like this. So notice CPU, C is per task and GPU is per node and, and task is per node. So none of these numbers change. You just change N and on uh, big end and little N. We then have some SLOC commands. So this is how you would get on interactively. So if you do a single GPU, a line would look like this, just getting a single GPU, uh, the 10 is the even distribution of CPU threads and one node, and then a full single node using the exclusive command or multi-node using the exclusive command if you wanted to. And this is where we set up our, you, you put your executable and your input, we run like this. So an executable and then an input file. So this is where you would, we, we, we define it in our code so you don't have to tweak much. And then there's two launches here, one for you're running it in S batch. So you just launch like this. If you're in an interactive node, you'd want to put your configuration in here. So then the S1 would look like this. And we have this also here to compare and look at it. So if you if you uncommented this and ran it like this on while in an interactive session, you should get the equivalent. So right on the interactive node, you run it and it'll run an S command with this exact config. And you can tweak it the same way up here. And then what we also got down here is how to do the profiling. Um, so here is Nsight Systems Profiling, and this is the, probably the one that's most useful. It just does a basic profile of the of the run. So there's your exe and your executable. We output it based on job ID numbers to get a unique ID every time. That's all it is. Output to this file, and this will give you a timeline. You can look up all the profiling stuff on, on NERSC's website. But this is the general line that we use for profiling. And then how to run it on multiple ranks, which is a bit complicated, but not, not that big of a deal. And it's listed here. And then how to do it in compute. So this is if you're looking into profiling and how to run these things with profiling. Otherwise, we have all the basics up here about how to configure your system. Uh, the only real trick that I would say when doing this to consider is always grab the entire node. Don't try and piece a node or get a part of it. If you do that, you start running into NUMA problems. Uh, how the, the, the CPU and the GPUs are laid out might not be exactly what you're expecting. And so you'll get a different configuration or run a little differently. So one thing that we usually do, unless we're running in this exclusive mode and getting or the, this interactive mode and getting one GPU, is we get the entire node, we ask for the, all the resources in the entire node and pick out the, part, the parts that we actually need for the run. That way you get, you're sure you get the same NUMA configuration, you get the same layout of your resources. And so you get consistent results. But otherwise, here it is. Uh, feel free to, you know, copy this one over and use it and borrow it and do whatever you need to and watch out for that GPU for per tasks flag, which is the one difference that you might want to account for if your if your code doesn't pre-configure your GPUs like Amrex does. So yeah, so that's a, a, a very interesting note about the 
how the code works and, and Jira's GPU versus GPUs per task. So, so if you're, so, so in, in summary then, if your code or for, for most codes, um, I guess yeah. they, they offload to a GPU and, and it's normally one GPU per task is the, is the most common assumption. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if the vast in certain codes, people. right. Yep. And so, and so for most people, they would use GPUs per task equals one. But in the case of Amrix, it does sort of careful management of the GPUs itself. Yes. And so you're giving, you're basically with, with GRES, you're giving Amrix control over how it distributes the GPUs. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're just telling um, Slurm, give me all the GPUs and let me figure it out. Yes, that is correct. So unless you unless your code does some special initialization, you probably don't. You probably want to change this line right here. But otherwise, it's identical. Yeah, it should be helpful. Hopefully, helpful to most users. That sounds good. And the the little um, bonus kind of Easter egg there of how to run Insight. <laughs> yes, to, uh, yes, to get a profile of your code is a, a very nice addition as well. Yeah, we have a lot of users who regularly ask that question. So we decided to throw it at the bottom of the uh, the samples uh, script there. So that's, that's turned out to be very useful. Uh, out of interest, have you seen that Insight, do you find it adds a lot of overhead? Do you, do you need to you know request more wall time or carefully shorten your job? Um, so what we have, we have built in, um, what are they called? The the uh, tiny the profiler wrappers that sort of define um, locations in it, and even with that in there, which adds a little bit extra overhead, and the N site systems profiler doesn't add a ton of overhead, maybe 10, 20, 30 percent. However, um, N site compute can add a ton of overhead when you individually uh, go after a single kernel. That can add a whole lot of overhead, especially if it's a big, thick, nasty kernel. So the systems, we can do that fairly regularly without too big of a problem. Now, you always, when you profile, want to do a smaller subsample. You don't want to do everything. If you do a you know full production run and try and sample it, you will see overhead. There's no doubt. But for like small little good test cases worth testing, no, there's not. The N site systems with the timeline over time and the overall view doesn't seem to give a really substantial amount of overhead that requires a lot of tweaking, which is good. It did it so first, yeah, so but it doesn't anymore. <laughs> yeah. So it's good to know you can get a, a bit of a sense of what your GPU code is doing with that. Uh, um, Robert, so that's most generically, that's exactly what I mean. Yes, we grab the device count, set them up, and then and parse them out. But for, for the most time, we do that. But there's a couple of cases where we want to do something more fancy, like give multiple GPUs to a single rank or a weird subset. And we want to have the flexibility to be able to tweak that inside the code. So yes, that's what we do differently. Correct. Yeah. So, so a, 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 I guess a normal code then that just calls uh, CUDA get device count and CUDA set device that can still use dash dash GPUs per task equals something. Should is be that, able to. Is that correct? Yeah. Essentially, it will find one and then put one, right? It, it, it depends on yeah. exactly what you want and then exactly what flexibility you want. But my guess is the vast majority don't bother to go through actually manually looking everything up. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Andrew has a comment about uh, Ascent Job Step Viewer tool. Ascent is the summit. Um, Yes, it's the summit test. If I remember, yeah. That's good. Um, so that, that, that's strictly actually a summit tool that Job Step Viewer, and um, uh, we don't have one. We have a job script generator that um, I'm not sure what the plan is for Perlmutter. If someone has has already put it on the docket to upgrade it for Perlmutter or all that kind of stuff, um, I'm not sure if it actually covers Core GPU either. I don't believe it does. So right. I don't think we have a tool like that, although we would really like one. Yeah. Right. So that sounds like it's a custom made tool at, for, for a cent, basically. So yes. A, a slight specific one. Yep. Sounds like it might be a, a, a nice one to uh, eventually copy there. It would take time is the issue. We've discussed that a lot, but that would take some time. Hmm. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, Jody. 
uh, were you able to access your script? Yeah, um, yeah, I'll share my screen in a second. Uh, yeah. Um, all right, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, that's working. Uh, do you see the terminal? Yeah. So uh, I can see you're on DTN03. Yeah, that's right, okay. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, show you my submission, job submission script for uh, training um, a neural network on um, a few GPUs um, on a single node. Um, if you would like to look at a script that does a, a multi-node training, then I can point you to a, a tutorial prepared by Steve and Mustafa. Uh, uh, but I'll, I'll just go through uh, this uh, script, which is uh, uh, yeah, one of the, uh, it, it's mostly just normal stuff, you know, it requests a node and then this one is requesting four GPUs. Uh, 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 I am using the NERSC PyTorch uh, NGC image uh, over here to train. Uh, so uh, I'm just specifying which shifter image should be uh, used to train. Um, this part here is essentially copying a, bun a bunch of data uh, uh, on line 22, as you can see, um, is copying some data to the, uh, the NVMe, uh, the solid state um, uh, drive on the GPU. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, yeah, uh, this, this part over here is telling me uh, that done the code uh, which uh, Python uh, uh, environment to use. Uh, and finally, you are uh, the line twenty nine is launching the PyTorch distributed uh, training job. Uh, uh, it's yeah. Um, uh, let me let me see cool. there. So so yeah, so in this one you're using four GPUs per task, right? Yeah, on a on a single node, and there's four GPUs on a node. So presumably that's there's. Oh uh, well, one I think there's here. eight GPUs uh, on a node, but I'm but using eight four GPUs on a node. Yeah, um, I mean uh, the only. Yes, I forgot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. The, 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 there is uh, if you use like let's say you use four GPUs and then I submit two different jobs and if they somehow end up on the same uh, node then. Uh, the GPU might not have enough memory to run uh, both jobs. So you have to be careful uh, when you're submitting, uh, you're using only part of the node um, or only a few GPUs on a single node. Right, so that's a that's a good tip. You need to remember the amount of memory that each GPU has yeah. when, and, uh, uh, when setting up the job. Yeah, and uh, I can also, uh, Paste the uh, uh, link to the uh, essay tutorial that um, Mustafa, Steve, and I think Josh have uh, developed, um, which should allow you to uh, create a, a script in which uses multiple GPUs and uses PyTorch uh, DDP. Yep. So this is kind of a, a, a handy example of um, using Shifter on the GPUs as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you can um, look at the, uh, what shifter images are available on uh, the NERSC repository using uh, uh, grep or something. And also you can build your yeah. own shifter image and uh, push it to NERSC. Do, do you happen to know when the shifter image was being built? If uh, anything special had to be done for it, for, yeah, for PyTorch to use uh, NERSC's GPUs? Um, I actually did not build this image myself. Uh, uh, but I, I don't think so. I mean, I have, uh, I used, I, I built an image um, a while ago and I don't remember doing anything uh, special. Uh, but at that time I wasn't using the distributed data parallel structure. So uh, I could be wrong about that. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's quite handy. You've got some, yeah. some images there to use. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. So, um, so we've only actually got about five minutes left in the meeting, but the, the last couple of uh, things don't don't usually take very long. Um, so I think it's probably a good time for a bit of a, a Q and A and uh, swapping so swapping stories. Uh, so I saw uh, William had a, a script, but unfortunately, it's not accessible today. Um, did anybody else have a job script that they're either using or trying to modify for GPUs that 
they would like to show and, and uh, you have a, a discussion around? And if not, I see there's been uh, quite a lot of uh, yeah, questions and answers and, and discussions happening in the chat. But if anybody has any uh, questions about um, you know, setting up GPU scripts that they'd like to ask you know, either our panel or the, or the community generally, please uh, unmute and speak up. Uh, I'd like to add that the default for Cori GPU is uh, non-exclusive access, that it's a shared uh, node access. So that if you uh, need exclusive access, you need to add, uh, is it dash Q uh, exclusive or something um, at the top of the script? Can somebody, uh, I forgot yes. if it is double dash exclusive or uh, uh, hash S batch, um, Exclusive. I forgot the actual syntax since it's on Cori uh, Scratch. Here we go. We have a, a, a bit of discussion in the chat. So it's a double dash exclusive. And I think that is a S batch option. So, yes, that's a, a good tip. The, the GPUs are uh, not exclusive by default. And um, yeah, so if you do need exclusive use of a GPU, and, and you might find that for a lot of things you don't, you know, you or exclusive use of a node rather, I think. Um, you'll probably find with GPUs that there's a you know, sufficient amount of power in each GPU that um, you, know, you only need a, a small portion of the resources on a node for, for you know, single GPU type jobs or, or smaller jobs. Yeah, yes, that's a, that's a good point, Rob. <laughs> you don't want to um, require all eight GPUs when, when you're trying to compile. Okay, so share my screen again. In the in the meantime, you've probably already seen this, but um, if not, it's just a, or, or, or even if you have a, a good reminder. Um, so the Cori GPU nodes have uh, their own docs help webpage at docsdev.nurse.gov. Uh, and amongst the various information here, there's actually kind of a, a diagram of what the node layout looks like. And so you can see there's, uh, you know, two CPU sockets with four GPUs attached to each CPU socket and NVLink across them all. So in the last couple of minutes, um, coming up, we're very interested again in uh, topic suggestions or especially if you'd like to talk about um, your work as a, as a topic and yeah, some things that you've done and or learned on NERSC systems, um, let us know, drop us a line either either uh, something in the webinars or, uh, or you can uh, direct message me in, um, in Slack or uh, send us a ticket. Um, yeah, it'd be great to hear from people. And a quick look over last month's numbers before we wind up. So uh, overall availability, we uh, actually took a, a few hits in April. We had a few, a few outages, unfortunately. There was, a, of course, you know, our regular scheduled monthly maintenance, but there was a couple of issues that hit uh, some of them external. So we had a, an electrical issue that took out uh, sort of a couple of cabinets with some knock-on effects. And, uh, and uh, I think it was electrical related, but this one was actually a hardware failure in a, in a cabinet over here. So we did take a, a few knocks during April. Um, that's it, HPSS and, and CFS. And, uh, continue to have very good availability. Uh, core utilization was very high. We're up at 97%. Um, large jobs were comfortably above our target. So we have a, a target of 25% of Cori's workload being uh, things that need something of Cori type scale. Um, and 
Yeah, so in April we had uh, a little over 30%, and you know, we've been sitting at a relatively high numbers for a, for a little while there now. Uh, tickets coming in and close at the beginning of May, we had a, a backlog of uh, about 400 and, or a little less than 500 tickets. Uh, so we typically see, you might've noticed a, a trend here over the last few months. It's, it's pretty normal to see in the five or 600 new tickets a month kind of range coming in. And uh, that's all we have for today. Thank you again, everyone for participating and especially um, uh, Kevin and Laurie and Jadeep for um, yeah, walking us through your scripts. Um, hopefully everybody saw enough to sort of get some ideas for tweaking your own scripts or you know, uh, to get kind of comfortable with getting started if you haven't used Cori GPU yet. Thank you all again. I'll uh, stop the recording now and we we'll look forward to seeing you at the Perlmutter dedication and uh, yeah, at our next meeting. If you have any script questions, feel free to throw them in the Slack chat. We can follow up. Yes, absolutely. We're uh, chatting in the webinars channel, um, but also for, for general questions there, there's a, you know, the general channel is good too.